right, um, what we're doing is, uh, the, the, today's panel about, is about what inspires writers, and, and for a lot of us, you know, where do we get our ideas from, why, why do we write what we write, and um, th th that can be either really broad or really, really specific. And so what I'm going to do is we're going to start kind of broad, and, uh, and we're going to start down this end this time, we'll start with Tyler, and we'll say, you know, until we have a chance to think, and uh, we'll say, wh where do you, where is your primary source of inspiration ideas for your writing? Where, what, what gets you going? Okay, so one thing that, uh, this, is, this is very broad, but it's just kind of <clears throat> seeing the world through uh, writer's eyes, just kind of, most of my books are based on things that seem kind of ordinary at the outset, like a, a book about janitors. Um, and that doesn't seem all that exciting, but I take a lot of inspiration in ordinary and regular things that I see, day-to-day -day routine things that, uh, that I see people doing, uh, whether it's, you know, just riding the bus or, or kids going to school or any of those really routine things that, that seem very ordinary in the outset <clears throat> are inspirational for me. Yeah, I think, um, I, you know, in a broad term, I, I think everything can be kind of inspiring. Uh, I think once you train your brain to, like, look for those ideas, they just are everywhere. Um, you know, it can be TV, movies, books, it can be, you know, the sci-fi channel is, like, fascinating to me, history channel, like, um, you know, you just take all these, um, things that are coming at you all day anyway, and your brain just works a little differently. It's like a muscle. Like the more that you use it creatively, the more ideas will just come to you through everything that you see. Do we have a lot of aspiring writers here, or people, or people that do write, or trying to bust in, or, or have busted in, maybe, <coughs> you know, like Comic Con. Um, and uh, cool, one of these days you might be able to have ice water at this. <laughs> 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 yeah, someday if you, if you dream big. Green room, <laughs> green room has There's snacks. also ice water at the back. <laughs> um, like, like for me, I get inspired whenever I see something cool. Like so, as a kid when I read The Lion, Witch, The Wardrobe, that broke my brain as a little kid. I was like, oh, that's possible as a story? You know what I mean? Like, and I started daydreaming about that kind of stuff the rest of my life, kind of. Um, I think right now the big things that fuel me is, is just a mix of observation and daydreaming. I pay attention to the world around me. I, I pay attention for strange details or strange facts, and, and, then, and then if they strike me as interesting or cool, then I run with them. To be specific, here's an example. My, word, my sister was once, once reading in a book that the word for witch in Arabic can be translated to one who blows on knots. To me, this is just a creepy, weird detail that ricocheted around in my brain, like one who blows on knots. There was just something wrong about it in a cool way. And so I decided in my Fable Haven books I would create a witch who was imprisoned by a knotted rope who could never get free until she got every last knot untied. And when people wanted to untie a knot, they would blow on the knot and make a witch. And if the witch came true, the knot would unravel. This was not what one who blows on knots meant. But that weird phrase sparked the thinking. So observation and daydreaming. Um, I think a lot of ideas come into your head all day long every day and they fall out just as quickly if you don't grab hold of them. And so a lot of it is just when an idea comes into your head that seems cool, that, that excites you. Because I think that um, when you grab hold of one of those ideas that excites you, because really every idea out there started out with something so small that it couldn't have a story made of it, just like the, the knots. Um, and then it's, it's the thinking about it and thinking, asking yourself more questions about it that really turns it into something really fantastic. So it's those ones that excite you the most are the ones that you're going to think about the most and have the most unique ideas with. So I think it's all a matter of when those ideas come in your head, just making sure you hang on to those exciting ones because if you don't, they, they drop out quick no matter how cool they are. I used to think that every book I would write would be based on you know one main idea. And then I started realizing that I wanted to take all these ideas and tie them together, and so it almost felt like each novel is, you know, a thousand-piece puzzle, puzzle that everything comes together. And I started realizing that if you do keep track, like what you're saying, of those little things, and you can kind of find ways that they can connect. So it doesn't have to be, my book is based on this one inspiration. I mean, it can be based on a thousand different things, but if you also find a concept or idea that you realize just really sticks with you, whether it's something with witches or 
For me, I remember learning about sirens and thinking, I am so fascinated by that. I just cannot get that out of my mind. And I wrote a whole novel about sirens. So if something is really staying with you. Is this like police car sirens or? No, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I love police car sirens. I'm just kidding. We're at Comic Con. We know what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's the blue red lights. Too. They're so flashy. Like, yeah. <laughs> They're so inspiring. Yeah. So if something stays with you, maybe it is cop car sirens, whatever, which is. <laughs> Maybe that's a sign that you need to explore explore options with that and see where it takes you. Um, you're gonna hear writers say this all the time, and it sounds really trite, especially when you're starting out and you're really trying to get going. Um, but ideas are everywhere. I mean, they're literally everywhere you look. There are ideas, um, and you'll find these little things that stick with you. Like you'll see a visual or a sound or a smell or a feeling. Um, and even if that thing doesn't fit in what you're working right now, save it. Write it down somewhere. I have this big file of just miscellaneous junk that uh, whenever I see something cool, I'll stick it in there. I saw a picture of a shaved bear on crack.com one time. It was a bear with mange. And it was the most, it was a cute bear, and they showed it what it looks like shaved, and it's a thing of nightmares. And I was like, <laughs> save it. So when am I going to use a shaved, look, a shaved bear monster? I don't know, but it's going in something somewhere. Yeah. It's awesome. Larry, I think it might look a little like us. <laughs> it does. We are shaved bears. Yeah. And it's horrific, with, and it's like, cuddly, nightmare. <laughs> but as a writer, those things are everywhere, so keep track of them. And, you know, I, I don't know if, I'll throw this out to you guys here in a second, but um, there are times where I will have an idea, or I will see something that inspired me, and think, wow, that's really cool, I want to use that, but it doesn't really fit what I'm working now, and I'll save it. I've had ideas that have been, you know, five or six years old now, you know, a visual or something that is five years old, that now I'm writing another book, and it's like, oh, hey, that fits. So there's really, there's no such thing as wasted daydreaming for a writer. It's the coolest job in the world. When you're daydreaming, and when you're thinking of crap, or you're watching TV, or surfing the net, you're working. <laughs> so um, I'm going to throw this out to the audience. This is what we oh, tell our sorry. wives. <laughs> yeah. I'm working, darn it. i got to stay up till 2 in the morning watching this. Yeah, yeah honey, I'm playing Titanfall for inspiration. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm going to throw this out to the audience again. and Or not the audience, I'm sorry, the, the panelists. We'll get to the audience, don't worry. We'll take your questions. Um, really specific ideas. Like pick, a, pick one specific idea that you're really proud of from one of your books. And tell us the story of where it came from. And uh, that one takes a second to think of, so we'll go ahead and anyone wants to go first? I got, yeah, I got it. So in my first book, there, uh, since it's a book about janitors and it mostly takes place in a school, there's this area where the, the students discover that there's this out of order bathroom that's been locked up and, it's, uh, and nobody's been in there for a long time. And then they discover that there's, the reason is because the janitors have locked it and they've hung up a sign that it's out of order. And the kids, the main characters, have to find a way to break in and then discover the, the magical item that the janitors have been hiding in that out of order bathroom for a long time. Well, I actually worked as a janitor at a middle school for a little while. I was uh, cleaning part time at night. And down by the gym, there was this boys' bathroom that was out of order the entire year and a half that I worked there. And the door was locked, and there was a sign on the door, and nobody could get in there. And I was just in charge of sweeping the hallway, so I'd go sweeping by, and I saw that door, and every time I passed it, I thought, you know, what if there was something more to it? What if, what if there was something kind of, uh, you know, magical being hidden in this, in this school? And so then I used that very specific detail in, in my book, in my first book. Which was called Janitors. <laughs> and it was about janitors. <laughs> Which is so awesome that you were a daydreaming janitor who then wrote a book called Janitors. And it was successful. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. awesome. Um, for me, I, I have really weird dreams. And I woke up one morning after a, a particularly bizarre one, and I was sitting there thinking, you know, I wonder if other people's dreams are like my dreams, or I wonder what my husband would think if he was in my dream, would he think I was like totally crazy, or what would he think? And I started thinking, you know, what would it be like to watch everyone else's dreams? And so in my book Insomnia, it's about a, a guy who when he goes to sleep at night, he sees the dreams of the last person he made eye contact with. And I'm like, like I'm a nice person, but I have like a, a really, really hardcore creepy streak. 
And so, <laughs> so like everything I touch just turns dark. Like you could give all of us the exact same idea and they would all turn very different books. Um, but, you know, so I was like, you know, he's, 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 he's people's dreams, you know, and it's killing him, you know, and it's just like, <laughs> I don't know. So he's dying of sleep deprivation and slowly going crazy. So I write really super happy books and, but yeah, it's, I just, you know, I just kind so it's of not like giving him more faith in the human race. <laughs> no, no, it's not. A wonderful dream. Not even a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So it, you know, it started off with just a, a weird dream, but it's all the next steps that you take with the idea that can turn it into something really unique and cool. Can I jump in there real quick? Yeah. So uh, Jen said something that if you were to give the same idea to all of us, we would all write something very differently. And I get asked a lot by aspiring writers, um, how do you? What if you have an idea that's kind of like an, a, an idea that you've read about in a book? Well, I always say, own it and just write it, and it'll come out so differently that people will never know that the original idea had, had been kind of based on something, or, or inspired, I should say, by, by something that you read. And I think that that's important, is we could, you, you draw inspiration from other creative works, and when you set down to create something yourself, whether it's art or, or literature or music, um, you're not ripping them off. You got inspired by them, and then when you do it, if you do it right and you do it your own way and you make it your own, then it comes out very differently and, and uh, no one would ever even be able to trace back the idea, probably, to what you had originally been inspired by. Or the opposite, what I've run into is when you write something and then a major movie comes out after you wrote the book and more people have read the book, movie that have read your book and they're like, you just ripped off Inception. I'm like, I beat Christopher Nolan by six months. Yeah. Look at the copyright date, the copyright date. I mean, look at the dates right on the book. <laughs> but they're going to do that, so. But yeah, Tyler brings up, that's a great point. Yeah, it is true. But what, what we really get paid for is how we tell a story. You know what I mean? Execution. Can you tell a story really well? Like, that's what you really get paid for as a writer. Um, your storyteller voice, how you craft your scenes, like all that kind of stuff. And hopefully, if it, you know, if it's not a good idea, no one's going to like it. But, but there's lots of good ideas. A big part of it is getting good at the craft. Um, to give you guys another specific idea that, that inspired me, my sister Liz likes the Killers, as do I, which is a, a rock band, you know. Um, not like, yeah, not the Killers in general or whatever. <laughs> we write lots of letters. <laughs> um, and there's a song called Dustland Fairy Tale with, this, with the line, Castles in the sky sit stranded, vandalized. And for her, that line was incredibly evocative. You know, the castles in the sky sit stranded, vandalized. Like, like, a, like, what a beautiful metaphor for broken dreams and things like that, right? Um, and she's like, I want you to make castles in the sky in your next series. And I was like, all right. <laughs> 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 and, so, and so I daydreamed about that, and I was like, huh, how can I make broken castles in the sky? What would be cool? And, and, and so I decided that we go to, in, in my newest series, we go to this world called the outskirts. And, and the outskirts is divided into five kingdoms. Each kingdom has different magic that works there, right? And so in the first kingdom, I decided that's a world where shapers can reshape physical reality in strange ways. And someone long ago had left this weird system in place where out of one cloud ball comes these broken castles in the sky. They drift across the sky into another cloud ball and disappear forever. And so there's a salvage operation that salvages from these broken castles in the sky and takes things. Um, and, and our main char character gets wrapped up in that salvage operation. Um, a really cool, weird idea that proceeded from a single line in a song. And I did use, um, like, the fact that I used that idea. I wanted to put that quote in the front of the book, you know? And so I, I actually, like, used that to meet Brandon Flowers and get backstage at a concert. <laughs> <laughs> and I got official permission, so that quote is in the book, which made me, like, super happy. Because, like, Sue says, like, yeah, from a very literary perspective, I want to make sure we're officially on um, getting this quote in my book. But really, I just wanted to go backstage. <laughs> and that was totally awesome. There are some perks to this. Yeah, so, so it didn't work the right angle, kind of, you know, like, should I keep a straight face? <laughs> okay, so I write for middle grade audience. And when I was that age, um, I spent a lot of time with my brothers, one just older than me, one just younger than me. And um, they're both brilliant and daring. And I don't know if you've experienced this before, but when you combine boy with brilliant and daring, it mostly means that you get into a lot of adventures that could possibly kill you. <laughs> but then they usually know how to get you out of it too. So um, I think I had such an adventurous childhood that, that that's what made me want to write action adventure um, now. 
So my first spark for an idea for sky jumpers came when my family was flying home from Disney World. And it was on a day that the entire country was covered in clouds. And so I had the window seat and I just stared out at the wrong side of the clouds for like three and a half hours thinking, wouldn't it be so cool if you could jump out of the plane and have those clouds catch your fall and have it slow you. So that was just such an exciting thing for me. It's one of those ideas that came in that I just couldn't let go of. So then I started thinking, well, what kind of a world would there be where there's a layer of air that's more dense than the rest of it to where if you got above it and jumped into it, then um, it would slow your fall. And then, of course, I made it um, deadly because, you know, it adds more complex and then invisible because then it's more dangerous and adds a lot more excitement that way, too. But that's just one of those ideas where the very where something that just excited me made me ask a whole lot more questions and to continue on. When I first moved into my neighborhood, I had a friend that came up to me and said, I grew up in this neighborhood, can I tell you a really creepy story? Yes, yes, I want to know. Not only did she have one about my house that was absolutely terrifying, but she said a couple years ago I was hiking, going for a little hike with my sister, um, on a really cloudy day, and it was by those mountains right by your house. We almost got to the top of the hill, and my sister started telling me, screaming at me to go down, turn around. And she was kind of laughing at her and didn't believe her until her sister started staring at her, and then she knew it was serious. And she said that she looked up and she saw a guy wearing all black, head to toe, and there was a really, really freaky moment for her, and she didn't know why there was this guy. They couldn't see his face, he was wearing all black. And they said they started turning and turning down the mountain and running as fast as they could, and they checked behind them, and apparently the guy fell and he started crawling on all fours <laughs> towards them down the mountain. And she's like, oh, and we got home and we were safe. But anyways, that was right by your house. And uh, obviously, I thought about that for a long time because she said that when he fell down, it looked like he had changed into an animal. Anyways, it was terrifying, but I thought, that sounds like a shapeshifter. I'm going to write a book about shapeshifters. <laughs> yeah, the, it's funny how the, 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 you get these from everywhere, and when something you said down there about insomnia reminded me of, of this, just a specific example, how everybody comes up with a different idea. I was uh, invited to do a, a short story for that anthology, Space Eldritch. And um, they wanted, I mean, I was going to do something with insomnia. And so my insomnia story turned out to be that this guy had a, uh, uh, a disease where he could no longer dream. But that's okay, because it saved him when Cthulhu invaded. You know? and, and just the different, so same basic, you know, you can take the same basic idea and just every writer is going to be massively different. Um, my specific example, one of an idea, uh, a lot of what I've accomplished in my writing career has been based on spite. Uh, as in, I'm going to prove somebody wrong. Like somebody says, you can't do that. <laughs> Done. I mean, I have to do it now. You turn and into a shaved bear. I do. <laughs> it's on, man. So I was, uh, I was at LTU a couple years ago, uh, or actually about four years ago, I was at LTUE on a panel with uh, Brandon Sanderson and Dave Farland and Lee Modisett. And uh, somebody asked a question about epic fantasies, and I had a really good answer, and I started answering, and the, the student cut me off. And he goes, no, 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 no. You're just an urban fantasy writer. I want to hear from the epic fantasy writers. What? I was like, oh, yeah? <laughs> and I was like, after the panel, I was like, hey, Brandon, what, what's an epic fantasy? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's like, what's this and this? is like, I'm going to write one. And so I went home, and um, I was like, I'm going to write an epic fantasy. And um, my son was reading noir Spider-Man. Um, and it was Spider-Man in a trench coat and a fedora. On the cover, it was black and white. And I looked at him and I realized, you know what? Back when everybody wore fedoras, unironically, it was like really cool. So I set my epic fantasy in the 1930s, and and there you go. And that's that's how it went. And uh, it was based on Spike and a Spider-Man comic that my, that I didn't even read. My son was reading it, and it's just like, man, fedoras and trench coats were awesome. <laughs> Done. And that's where the Grimoire Chronicles come from. Those two things that day. So, um, okay, um, does Panelists, before we start taking questions for the audience, do you guys have any other specific little stories or examples you want to, you feel inspired to share? One thing that I was thinking about when you were talking about one person will write the story so differently than any other author, if it's even based on the same idea, and I think of that with fairy tales. How many times have you heard the fairy tale uh, Cinderella or any of the Snow White, and it's retold in so many different ways, and it's still, you can find a way to make it original and make it different. So if something sparks an idea, you're going to end up writing something so different than anyone else would write. 
It's absolutely true. Um, okay, so there's nobody else. So I'm going to take some panel uh, questions from the audience, but real fast, the rules of taking questions. Um, a question ends in a question mark, okay? <laughs> and a question has a point. So uh, don't give us your thesis. Just give us your question, okay? <laughs> so back in the back. Yes? Okay, so, so so how do you manage to break through sure. that? I've got, I've got a good one for that. Sure, so, okay. Writer's block is a filthy lie. Okay. <laughs> no, 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 let me explain why. I, I'm, a, I'm a retired accountant, um, okay? I was never allowed to have accountant's block. I really don't feel like lightning me today. I'm just not into it. My muse isn't there to do the spreadsheet. Fire, okay? Doctors, you're not allowed to doc. I don't want to do your heart transplant today. I'm just not feeling it. Okay? No. See, that, that's, all right, here's the thing. When you're experiencing what people call writer's block, we're giving like, this mystical power to something that's a bunch of crap. Really what it is is you're bored, or you're tired, or you don't feel like it, you don't feel like working, or you just want to go play Xbox. Okay, that's perfectly normal, perfectly fine. And you can either do two things. You can either plow through it and work like you're like a professional, or you can give in and say, you know, I just don't feel like working today, I'm going to take today off. But if you say that if you give it this writer's block, like this mystical power, it's not, you're giving it power it doesn't have. So what you want to do is like, if you're stuck on a scene, that's your brain telling you this scene sucks or you're bored or you don't know what to do, skip that scene and go write the next scene that you do know what's going to be. The beauty of word processors is I can go back and write that later. Or write the scene after that, or write the scene that you're interested in, but whatever it is, keep your brain engaged and keep going. Or if you're totally hosed on this one project, fine, stop this one project and go work something else. Go work on a short story. You know, go write a go to write a three thousand or a five thousand word short story to break out of that rut. But whatever you do is be a professional, treat it like a job, and it will become a job. Anybody else want to? Yeah, can I jump? Oh. So I think that sometimes we feel like we, there's a there's a block to our creativity that we're not succeeding in our writing and that's because we've written ourselves into a corner and like right now there's this I'm working on the fifth and the final book in the janitor series and there's this idea that I've had for a while and I and I think it's really really cool but it's not working and so I'm just trying to uh, get myself to the point where I can abandon the idea you know, and feel good about abandoning the idea that I've been holding on to for a while. Uh, because I've tried to write it from every different angle and, and this one idea is not working, which means that it's probably time to just man up and throw the idea out and write something different. Yeah, I also think um, one of the more important things to realize as an author is to, you need to give yourself permission to suck. Like, it is totally fine for you to write 3,000 words of total suckage before you get into anything that's good and worth keeping. You can always cut it later, and sometimes there's like, you know, it's like an engine, you need to warm it up a little bit before, before things um, get any good. And, and that's okay, and that's pretty normal. And so, you know, sometimes I think that's what stops people when they, when they get writer's block is, this, this idea that you're not really sure what, what you're going to do with this scene, or you're not really sure, like you have a plan for it, but you're not really sure how it's going to work out, and, and it, just do it. Just write. That can be a big problem if you're not sure what you want that scene to accomplish. You know, either, either kill the scene, or find a different scene that will accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. You know, every scene should be revealing character and advancing the story. Um, so sometimes you'll get stuck just because that scene isn't the right scene, right? So maybe you have to kill it. Find a scene that's interesting to you and that's sucking you in and that your mind isn't telling you is boring. Yeah, this is your subconscious saying, this sucks. Often, yeah, often, yeah. Um, although I agree with a lot of what you said, I don't believe that, I, I mean, I do believe in writer's block. Just be, I don't I, believe I just in accountant's mean. block just because I, I think, believe in writer's block. I think in it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe. Clap if you believe in writer's block. <laughs> Stronger. <laughs> <laughs> and you can integrate the filter, you can run into a writer's block. And so you kind of have to figure out what's behind it. Sometimes it's not that you haven't spent enough time thinking about your story before you start writing it. And so you just don't know what to write next. Sometimes it's fears. Um, like fears that you suck. 
which you've got to give yourself permission to stop. And sometimes it is that you are in not a very creative place and you need to get refueled creatively somehow. Um, like when I go to see a movie and it shows all the trailers before, that refuels me creatively a lot. So sometimes it's you're just kind of spent, so you've got to kind of get to what the root of it is that's stopping you and figure it out. I posted on Facebook once, Ask writers what stops you from writing, and I swear, like 20 minutes, 50 people responded. Because so writers get stopped a lot, and half of it was surfing Facebook, being lazy, Facebook. surfing yeah. Facebook, exactly, <laughs> um, or just not feeling like doing it. But then the other half was really kind of more deep things, like um, fear for a lot of things, even fear of succeeding and what the path that takes you down. And so I think with writer's block, you got to figure out if it's just something that you need to push through and gain habits because the more often you write, the more creativity comes. And sometimes it's taking a break and spending more time thinking about your story. Sometimes it's doing something different that's creative that um, you're not going to be judged on. And sometimes it's just figuring out what is the root of it and dealing with that, whatever's mentally stopping you. I think you need to find your creative environment. If I tried to go into a cubicle with like some sort of fluorescent lighting and just stare at a blank page, I might not get a lot, a lot of ideas. For me, if I have to, if I like surround myself with things, usually bowls of chocolate and M&Ms or something that makes me really happy, I'm gonna be a better writer. If you're trying to write in the morning every day and that's not working, try writing at night, try writing outside. Try to find a way to front load your brain creatively, create well, creatively, yes, so that you can be in that environment and, and be able to, to, to get over the blank page. Uh, it's probably a different panel, but you'll notice the more successful a writer gets, the fatter we get. <laughs> it's because it's, you know, Coke, Chippos, Coke, Chippos. Yeah. <laughs> I'm brilliant! <laughs> and then when we're not writing, we go on the road and eat at restaurants. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's like, yeah. One it's doomed, month, one month like doomed straight of restaurant food, man. And I, I come home from bookstore so fat. <laughs> <laughs> this is as thin as it gets, ladies. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, um, let's go ahead and let's get some other questions from the audience here in the red shirt. Yeah, so get kind of get inspired with that fantasy crazy junk, right? Like, here it is. Write what you're most passionate about, right? Like for me, I read a couple of fantasy books and I'm gone. Like, 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 like my head likes to live there. And so because of that, when I get bored and I daydream, I make up fantasy scenarios. Um, a lot of the fantasy scenarios I make up are totally dumb and I would not share them. But every now and then, they're mostly me being real smug. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> My wife, like I'm just, like my wife's like kind of a peasant. <laughs> I don't like that one, I choose her. <laughs> okay, anyways, back to reality. I, I love taking off into fantasy, so here, but, but, but yeah, being more serious. Um, I daydream about stuff, and every, but every now and then I will daydream into a concept that becomes like a playground in my imagination. Um, for example, when I came up with the idea of secret wildlife parks for magical creatures, which is kind of the foundational idea of my, my Fable Haven series, that idea of secret wildlife parks for magical creatures became a huge playground in my mind. And I would go back to it over and over and over it. And, and the more I daydreamed about it, the cooler it got. And that's how I knew I was onto something, right? And so, I mean, I would say, if fantasy is something you like, cast out your mind and just like try to find a scenario that to you is really intriguing and that you haven't seen before in, in the way that you are envisioning it. You know, the, the comics, when the light bulb goes off over your head, the aha moment, I mean, writers really have that. And when you feel that passionate about an idea, like, wow, that's so awesome. I have to do something with it. Then you know that's good. Save it. And you can build tons of it. It's amazing. When your brain starts, when you unlock your subconscious and your brain just starts tripping, you know if you're doing really well in a novel, for me, like when I write, and, and I work pretty long hours, so I'll write, and I'll write till late at night, and then I'll go to bed, and then I dream about the world that I'm creating. And I wake up in the morning with new ideas. Or I'll wake up at two o'clock in the morning and think, oh, that's so cool, I've got to put that in. You know, and usually by dawn you realize that it's complete crap. But, <laughs> but when you're that passionate about it, your brain will feed itself. And you will just keep coming up with more stuff. And, and one of the things too, it's like, it's like working a muscle. 
Uh, um, you'll hear artsy farty writers types say quantity is never synonymous with quality. That's that's not true. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci, William Shakespeare. Okay, the more you create art, the more the more you practice creating art, the better you're going to get at it, and the more likely you are to create something actually brilliant. So just keep going. Just keep pushing yourself, and, and you'll, you'll keep you'll get better as you go. I also think, like you were talking about with the what you're passionate about, that's really important. Um, I'm like all evolved now and stuff, but I haven't always embraced the fact that I like to write scary things. And so after I wrote Insomnia, I actually tried to write. I was like, I'm gonna write the happiest book ever. I was like, I'm and all the ponies died. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I'm gonna write about this girl that can turn into like a unicorn. It's gonna be so happy and perfect. And I got like 30 pages into it, and like she was a goth unicorn. And there was like drug use happening. And I was just like, no, no, I just turned into Game of Thrones. <laughs> so sometimes you really have to figure out what you are good at and what what you are most passionate about. Sometimes it's figuring that out before before you can really find the the world. Trust that inner compass. Yeah, what, you, what you think is cool, others will think is cool. Hopefully, yeah. yeah you have to follow your instincts. Like uh, sometimes. This just happened a couple days ago. I was talking some ideas over with my wife, and um, she's really patient and good. And so she listens to all of my idea ideas, and then finally she's she like throws one out there. And so she throws out this idea, and I said, "That made me feel sick inside." <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I realized what I'd said, and I was like, "Whoa, no! I, I mean, that was a good idea, honey. Yeah, it was really good. I, I just don't think I'm going to use it this time. You know, we have all done that to our spouses. I'm going to bed. Yeah, yeah. because they're not in our heads. We like to bounce stuff off them, and they're like, "Well, you should try this. Not stupid." Yeah, and and literally, like, like literally, it was like this feeling. I was like, "Ugh," you know, like that idea just did not resonate. Your with Your imagination me. is revolting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, uh, anyway, so you have to follow your, your instincts. And sometimes I give myself those own ideas. I'm just sitting there and then I'll have an idea. You know, <laughs> that was a revolting idea. You know, that was terrible. Can you give me those ideas? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I pass those on to Jen. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's go. So sometimes it's one or the other. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes they evolve together. I don't know if there's an answer for that. Yeah, the opposite. Sometimes like I'll have a really great story idea. But I can't figure out, you know, the characters that would carry the story through. Who should do this? Who would yeah, be interesting? Who, yeah, to see who would be interesting? Yeah. And, and 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 coming up against the challenge of just not writing the same type of character in every single book every time, because obviously where you start is with the characters you're maybe familiar with getting in their in their heads, um, like creepy people. Yeah, it's got the unicorns. Yeah, yeah. Gothic unicorns. Yeah. Safe bears. <laughs> I think part of it is there's always talk about if you're a plotter or a pantser. Somebody who thinks of their plot ahead of time or if you fly by the seat of your pants. And I think the people who tend to be pantsers tend to be really strong character writers. They take the character and try to see what they do. Um, and then plotters plot everything out and their characters kind of go along with the plot. Um, and in either way, it's perfectly fine. I found, I thought it was a plotter for a long time, but then I found out I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. So I have like a very general plot outline and then I start to work on my characters and really get to know them and as I know get to know them they kind of still though the general plot is there how you get there is a different story just like we would all write a different story here um, it, even given the same ideas so it's kind of the same thing with the character they kind of take it where they're going even though it's the same general idea if I can throw something else in there um, so when for an example when I wrote janitors I knew that Obviously, janitors clean up gross things and uh, deal a lot with germs and things. So the very first thing I did was I made up a main character and I gave the main character a real uh, germophobia. Because I thought at, at every point through the story, he would be at odds against what he was supposed to be doing. So while my main character might not have a problem you know, grabbing his magic mop and, and fighting off this monster, if he has to, if he like falls down on the bathroom floor and his hands touch the ground, he has to wash, you know, before he can go on fighting. And so he's constantly at odds. And so that's one where I came up with a plot, and then I served my character to kind of be uh, in juxtaposition against my against my plot. So they're they're constantly at odds, my concept and my character. And creating characters that are at odds with each other can be a very powerful thing too. A similar idea for similar reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm kind of the same way. I feel like when I finish a novel, it's easier, well, it's easier for me to go and change the characters and tweak them than to change the plot, and that's not going to be, it's going to be
going to be different for everyone, but if there's a plot hole, it's kind of like, oh, you're going to have to do a lot of rewriting, you know? Whereas for a character, I feel like I can go back in and do little things to, if I need to change their personality or change their relationship with someone, I feel like for me it's easier to work with characters. And so I think I just, when I fall in love with a plot, I want to, I want that plot to be so strong. And then like they were saying, have the characters kind of just contribute to that and they work together. The more, the more you write a character, the more that person becomes real to you, the more they're going to evolve and the more they're going to affect your plot. Um, because if they're really real and you, your plot says this person's going to do this or this, but you get this character who's written out that they're too strong for that or they're too weak for that or whatever it is, your character's going to change the whole scope of the book, depending on the character. So. But you're the boss. You do what you want. Um, we had a question right here in front. Larry, looks like we have about five minutes left. Oh, really? Oh, okay. So this will be our last question. We'll five minutes in the morning. Right. Yeah, we'll go fast. We have uh, multiple story ideas that you can't really combine into one story. How do you choose which inspiration to follow? Whichever one is most awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like if they don't work together, you're saying? Yeah. You just... There's just two ideas that you just love. How do you... Two separate books? I... Yeah, chase your favorite. I mean, I think that's, that's pretty straightforward. Chase your favorite. And then that second one, you never know. Like, bringing together two different ideas can be a great way to enrich and make a story cool. And so having that second idea floating around out there, you can always see if, oh, if I combine this with this other idea, all of a sudden that makes magic. Because sometimes taking really different ideas and trying to reconcile them into one story makes you discover all sorts of interesting possibilities. I also think that um, while I don't recommend, you know, of course, chasing trends or anything like that, I think it's really good to be aware of what's happening in your industry, especially for a debut. Um, if, you, if you have two ideas and one of them has something in it that is really, really hard to sell right now, something that's totally overloaded in the market for some reason. Obviously, you want to take, you want to follow your heart, but you also want to take that into account. If you're really even on them, it's always a good tiebreaker. So she's being, if you're being really pragmatic, take the most commercial, basically. Right? Well, or just, you know, sometimes, oh, I don't know, what like, vampire books were really hard to sell for a while, right? So if you're, one of them's a vampire book, you might, and you're like really dead even on them, maybe that's going to tip your scales a little. If you are thinking commercial, here's the formula. Something that fits into an existing category but is different than everything in that category in a really cool way. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that is your formula. And if you can do that, you can probably sell something. I just came across this problem just now. And it's two very different stories. Um, and my agent really likes both of them. And so I started writing the first few chapters of both of them. And so one of them has grabbed me more than what the other one has. I love them both. And that will like, the other one will likely be the story I write next. But it's the one that once I actually started writing that stuck with me more and made me more excited was the one they chose. Okay. I do believe we're about out of time, guys. It's been a real pleasure. Um, do you have any uh, closing plugs from the audience, other things that you're doing that you want anybody else to know about? Or, plugs. Go to the line and plug. Plug. Be nice to the janitors. <laughs> 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 That's all I got. Like, like, yeah, right. I'm, yeah. I'm raising janitor awareness. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go around the country promoting janitorial work. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Also, um, Brandon and I are doing a book signing at the Shadow Mountain booth, which is like in the 1800s. Right now. Right. Yeah. Like a well, I mean, right, right now. Yeah. As soon as we can get done. Um, I'm on every day, so. And I have uh, it's on me bookmarks if anybody wants to come and get one. And I have a I'm on panels too, so you, you can watch from me. I'll, I'll do some stuff tomorrow and some stuff Saturday. This is my only panel today, but like Tyler said, we'll be signing books. My new one's Five Kingdoms. It's cool, I promise. Okay. <laughs> um, I have panels tomorrow and the next day, and signings of both. I have to leave right after this. Um, I have bookmarks as well, and um, also there's a really great conference coming up called Storymakers. So if any of you writers out there want to go, um, I know they are planning on having flyers here later, but the um, cutoff date for registering is this Sunday. And it is next week, and it's a really great conference if you are interested in learning more about writing. I have a signing later today at 3 o'clock, and panels, and trying to find a good costume to wear for Jurassic Comic Con. So, any suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm on all the panels. Um, no, um, all I can say is be super nice to the, the volunteers and the staff at Comic Con because they're going to have 100,000 people here and they're awesome. So thank the staff, thank the volunteers, and be cool to them. Thanks everyone.